Well, hello everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, this uh, very important session. I'm I'm so glad tonight to be joined by my uh, dear friend and brother in Christ, uh, Dr. Jay Smith. Um, Dr. Smith uh, and I go quite a way back. So let me let me start off again by saying that I'm very glad to uh, have my dear friend, uh, Dr. Uh, Jay Smith. And uh, as I said before, we started off way back in the, I think the early nineties, Jay. And early, I think at that time right. you were, you were doing your doctoral work. No, not in the nineties. No, I didn't, I didn't start my doctoral work until about 2010. Uh, I, and then I finished it in 2007, 16. Okay. No, I was probably doing pre-doctorate. That, that was when I was doing the historical critique. I started that in 1995, but that was not, that didn't go towards my doctor. My doctor went into, uh, was on polemics and apologetics. Right, right. Okay. So I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was around that time that you were getting interested in Islam and getting involved in Islam. Is that around, around that time? Well, I've been interested in Islam for, uh, for, in Islam for almost 40 years now. I started way back in 1983. Okay. I started working in Islam, did my first master's in 1984-85 in Islam. Uh, so I got my master's in Islam from Fuller Seminary back in the 80s. Uh, then I went to uh, Senegal for five years with my wife to work on in Islam in a very Sufi environment, a much more folk Islam, not orthodox Islam as we know it. Uh, then I was sent to London to engage with the more radical Muslims in 1992. And we stayed there from 1992 all the way to 2017. Right. I think the first time I heard about you, uh, Jay, was when I was debating Shabir Ali in the early 90s. And uh, it was later on that I began to, uh, when you started your research on the sources of the Quran and the, the origin of the Quran and the, yeah. the various manuscript traditions in the Quran, uh, that's when I first heard about you. But tonight we, we want to talk about the preservation of the Quran. One of the things that we constantly hear uh, from our Muslim friends, our Muslim apologists, uh, almost like a mantra, is that the Quran that we have today is the same Quran that Muhammad had. It's the same Quran to the very dot, to the very word, to the very letter. And mm -hmm. so this, this seems to be an argument that our Muslim friends always use to uh, enhance the Quran and basically say, well, you guys, you Christians have all these various variants in your Bibles, but unlike your Bible, our Quran has been perfectly preserved since the time of the Prophet Muhammad. Maybe you could speak towards that, Jay. Um, is it true that the Quran that we possess today has been perfectly preserved since the seventh century when Muhammad died in 632 of the Common Era? Well, let, let's back up and let's say, where, where is it they're even getting that idea from? Did it come from uh, something they've just made up in the 21st century or something they're just using today to kind of to confront Christians uh, in apologetics and polemics? No, this is this exists in the Quran itself. It's internal to the Quran. In chapter 85, 22, you have the the uh, the reference to this eternal tablet that has this preserved tablet, as, as it's called, that all the exegetes suggest is eternal. It has always existed. It's the uncreated Quran. So that's internal to the Quran itself. In chapter 10, verse 15, uh, and in Surah 18, verse 27, it says very clearly that nobody can change it. If it's eternal, no human can have any part in changing it because it then it eradicates its eternality. How can a human come, uh, intercede or even corrupt or pollute or change something that is eternal? And to make sure that it doesn't uh, get changed, and there it's, and that's where Muslims have imposed this idea: not one word, not one letter. N not many Muslims would say dot, because most Muslims know the dots were added in the eighth century. Right. But certainly, word and letter that n has never changed since the eternal Quran was then sent down piecemeal over a twenty-two year period to Muhammad between six ten and six twenty six thirty two. So that those two cl claims are there. The third claim is that in, in chapter. Um, 15 verse 9 of the Quran, it's very clear that Allah is going to preserve it from being changed. So therefore, it's Allah himself who will make sure that no word, no letter is changed. That is, so Muslims have no other, they have no escape. They, they can't go right, left, or center. They cannot say, well, we can say, we, there's, there's no such thing as 
um, progressive revelation or that this is that this has any human intervention like we believe the Bible is. We know the Bible has been changed. We know the Bible is written by men. We know who wrote them. We know when it was written. We know how it was written. We know where it was written. And we know where the changes are because we admit it. We put we actually put footnotes in uh, Mark chapter 16 and, and warn the reader from verse 9 to 20. Be careful. These aren't in the earliest Greek manuscripts. We do that willingly because we know that if it's written by men, there's always that opportunity or that a possibility that the scribes can manipulate it or people later on can manipulate it or we don't have the originals, which we don't. But see, the Muslims can't make that excuse. So we're talking about two different genres of authority. Our genre of authority says, yes, it's written by men. We make no bones about that. We admit it from the get-go. Muslims can't say that because the Quran is very clear. It is outside. It is above. It is eternal. It has never been tampered with. Right. And if it was tampered with, it's no longer the word of God. So their view of revelation is has been put up so high. This idea of preservation has been around since the very beginning because the Quran says so. Now, what has happened is that the difficulty is when it was sent down, let's just say hypothetically it was sent down. You and I know it was not sent down. You and I know that there was, well, you may not know this, but I know there was no Muhammad who lived in a place called Mecca at all. We're not going to get into that discussion tonight. Right, right. Somebody, right. somebody put that book together. Somebody right. put this book together here. This is the Quran, right? All 114 surahs. Somebody right. did so. Now, the story about this, the story about how this was put together comes from Al-Buhari. Al-Buhari writes this in 870. Look at the date, 870. Right. Muhammad died in 632. You're talking 240 years later. It's right. the story about how this book is written down is there in Al-Buhari, volume 6, book number uh, 61, hadith number 509 and 510. And that's what Muslims have to do, have to go to. They have to go to Al Buhari. That's their problem. I mean, I feel sorry for Muslims. Thank God we don't have this problem with the Bible. Right. And it's very clear what Al Buhari says is that Muhammad received this Quran between 610 and 622 in a place called Mecca, and then he moves to Mecca and receives the next part. Well, if you look at the Quran, just it's divided in half. So the right. second half, this goes from left to right. It goes follows the Arabic. So this half was from. This half there was revealed to Muhammad in Mecca and the first 12 years of his ministry. This half was revealed in Medina when he moves up to Medina. That's another city northeast of Mecca and receives this half in Medina. Right. When he dies, then Al-Buhari says, when he dies, the Quran has not been written down. That's right. It's been memorized. It's been written on bones, stones, pieces of bark, things like that, but not in a book form. So after he dies, which is rather inept of Muhammad, don't you think, for not yes. written down? What's the purpose? If that's your whole mission is to receive the Quran and then make sure that it gets preserved for those who come after, shouldn't you have written it down? You have a secretary named Zaid ibn Thabit. Why didn't he write it down? Isn't that his job? That's what he should have done. You can say that Muhammad couldn't read and write, but who cares whether Muhammad could read and write? Zaid ibn Thabit was there. He didn't right, need right. to read and write. Zaid ibn Thabit was the one that heard it. He should have written it down. Anyhow, he dies without having it written down. There's a battle up in Yamama, according to the traditions. That's the traditions, the 9th and 10th mm -hmm. century. I'm going to keep referring to the traditions, the standard Islamic narrative, as we call it, the S-I-N, sin, the traditions. Uh, that's the what is giving the story of how the Quran is put together. And this battle up in Yamama, 70 of those who had memorized it died. Well, when they died, they took their, their, uh, their memorizations with them, obviously. This became such a crisis that Abu Bakr immediately got Zaid ibn Thabit. This is all in Al Buhari. I'm yep, paraphrasing yep. it, and had him re to write down that which the Prophet had not done. Zaid ibn Thabit even remonstrates it. Wait a minute, what? How can I do something the Prophet didn't do, or had me do? You're asking right, me right. to do something the Prophet didn't do, and they said, "Yes, we are," because this is such a crisis. Memorization is not good enough. Bingo. When Muslims come to you and say, we don't care if there's any manuscript, we know it was memorized, just remind them of that story. Remind yeah, yeah. them of Abu Bakr. Remind them that with 70 dying, just 70, that became such a crisis that they had to get it written down. Why? Because if it wasn't written down, if any more died, their Quran would die with them. Right, right, That's right, the problem. Right. So that happens in 632, 634 around that time. Right, right. 20, now, what happens to that copy? It's given to Abu Bakr, who gives it to Uman, who gives it to his daughter, who used to be a wife of Muhammad. Her name was Hafsa. She puts it under her bed and leaves it there for 20 years. Isn't that rather inept? Mm -hmm. What's the purpose of writing something down and you leave it under your bed? 
Think exactly. through how stupid that's. Well, I don't want to use the word stupid, but inept that is. <laughs> so 20 years later, here comes Uthman. Uthman is now in power. He's the third caliph. They have another battle. Isn't it interesting? It's always at a battle where these crises happen. Well, maybe that's pretty good. It still happens today. They're up in Azerbaijan, and Uthman has sent, um, um, what is his name? Uh, I can't remember his name, but he's up there with all of those who've come from Mecca and Medina. They have joined the other Muslims who live in Iraq and the other Muslims who live in Syria. Now, remember, this is just 20 years after Muhammad has died. They're having another battle, and that battle, after the end of the battle, they go to the mosque. And in the mosque, they are praying, but they're hearing prayers that are related from the Quran differently than what they know. And they're hearing it said differently from Iraq and differently from Syria. And they come to blows. They start fighting each other. That's not the Quran. This is how it should be. No, that's... And what they're listening to is probably the Fatiha, because you always start with the Fatiha, the first seven mm -hmm. verses. If in the first seven verses there are differences, that shows you there are different Qurans. How they were able to have different Qurans in a 20-year period in that far away when there wasn't even many Muslims up there, I don't know. Nonetheless, that's what the story says. So Mudaifa, that's his name. Mudaifa is absolutely livid with anger. He comes zipping back down to, to Medina and he goes to Uthman there in his uh, in his room says, we've got to do something about this. We cannot have different Qurans. So it's so bad that he's saying there are different Qurans. That means there's quite a few differences between what they heard and what they know. So what does Uthman do? Great. Okay, let's get that Quran that we give to Hafsa. Let's get Zaid ibn Thabit to rewrite it again. Right, right. Why rewrite it? Why don't you just take what's there? It's all rewritten. Why do you need to rewrite it? And then he says to Zaid ibn Thabit, if you have any disagreement, any disagreement, if you're just copying it word for word, letter for letter, yeah, remember yeah. word for word, letter for letter, not one yeah, difference? Yeah. If you're just copying it, it would be the exact same, unless you're a pretty bad copier. What he should have said is just copy it word for word and make many, many copies of it. That's all I want. They didn't have Xerox machines back then. You had to do it by hand. But he says, if you have any difference, use the Qurayshi dialect. Wait a minute. Now stop and think, Tony. What's wrong with that? What yeah. is a Qurayshi dialect? What is a dialectical difference in Arabic? I don't know. Do you do you read Arabic? Do you write Arabic? A little bit. A little bit. How do you find dialectical differences in Arabic? Today. Today. Just pronunciation, really. How do you find different pronunciation? Where do you find the pronunciation? Where do those come from? Uh, usually they come from the diacritical points. The dots. Yeah. The diacritical points. And the vowel. Yeah. The dhamma, the yeah. kasar, and the fatah. Yeah. Were there right. any dots? Were there any Dhamma no. Qatar Qasra in the seventh century in six? So None. how can this be dialectical differences? Right. Ooh, two, 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 two. When Muslims say these are nothing more than dialectical differences, they're confusing it because they don't understand the history of Arabic. There were no dots and vowels that early. That's right. the problem. That's why you had to create all these. We're gonna get to those. So that's not till the eighth century, though, and the ninth century, and the tenth century, but we're down in the seventh century. So here you are. He's saying, why is it, how is it you can have different Quran? How can you have different, make sure that there's only one, one Quran in the Qureshi dialect, in the Qureshi language, which right, means right. we're talking about different Arabics or different languages of Arabic, not dialectical, not pronunciation. These are different words. I'll get to that. I'll show you and I'll prove that. Why? Because they have different words in Iraq and different words up in Syria. That's what he found. He knows. Zaidi bin Tabi does that. And then he gives it to, hands it to Uthman, and then Uthman does interesting thing. He makes five copies. Some say it could be as, as many as nine. Nonetheless, let's go with five. Let's go with the one that the traditions say. He makes five copies, sent, leaves one in Medina, sends one down to Mecca, sends one over to Basra, sends one up to Kufa, and then sends one up to Damascus. So five cities, all with five copies, all in this Qureshi Arabic. Can't be dialectical differences, can't be done pronunciation differences. Why? Because there, there is no pronunciation if you only have 16 letters. And in the 7th right, right. century, there are only 16 letters of Arabic. That's the problem. So obviously, these are different Arabic words. But I thought the Quran is only one, that there are no difference in words, and, and there are no difference in even letters. Am I correct? That's right. Well, what is then, and to underline what I'm saying, look and see what Uthman does next. He goes and amalgamates all the other different Qurans, right? And he burns them. Now, what does that tell you, Tony, if he burns them? Yeah, he burns, he burns them, them because, because there's real textual differences. And he's trying to get rid of, obviously, the evidence. And he standardizes one authorized version, if you will, of the Quran. Okay. Muslims will say these are nothing more than dialectical differences. 
Right. Yeah, roof. Cut that down real quickly. Yeah. Dialectical differences are pronunciation that you do orally. How can you burn oral recitation? Right. When you burn something that's oral. You burn your mouth. You burn your tongue. Right. No, you burn books. Burks is what he was. He wasn't burning people. He wasn't burning all the people in Iraq and in, in, in Damascus. He was burning books. If right. they're books, these are rosum. Rosum right. are the skeletal texts, right? The right. consonantal texts. The 16 letter text, not the 28 letters that we have today, not the diacritical marks, not the way you pronounce it. These are actual skeletal texts. So he is burning different texts that differ. That's why they differ. That's why he had to burn them. And then he sends five copies up to those five cities so that never again would there be any differences in the text. And he sends a reader with each one so that they would read it correctly. Now, that's where the pronunciation comes in, but the text is there. And doesn't matter what the text is, you can read it different ways, depending if you are from Morocco or if you are from Jordan or if you are from any other Arab country. The way you read that skeletal text, you will put your own pronunciation for your own dialect. But that is vowelization. That is diacritical dottings. Right. That so obviously, this is completely different script. I mean, completely a completely new text. Hmm. Mm hmm that's seventh century, right? All right. Seventh century. I'm going to move my, my, I'm here because I want you to look at these books behind me. Now we come into the eighth century. So here's the next big problem. And this is the big problem. This is the huge problem. It's obvious that when you look at those 16 letters, you cannot read what you're looking at. If you just take one little, remember all Arabic words have three letters, three skeletal letters. That's why whenever you want to go to a dictionary to look up an Arabic word, you need to go mm -hmm. to the third person masculine. Right. Three letters. And then you just add different letters on either side to, to get the different adjectives and the different verbs and all the rest. Now, those three letters in 7th century Arabic only made up, only were, only had a choice of 16 letters to choose from. Well, there could be all kinds of combinations. Kataba, Kutiba. Good kitab, kataba. Three letters. It could be all kinds. It could be yep. word, be reading. It could be all kinds. Um, bite, bite. You can get nineteen different words just by looking at three letters put together if you don't know what they are. So mm -hmm. something needed to be done. Something had to be done, and to make to to uh, ameliorate person be able to read it, let alone memorize it correctly. They had to invent these dots, and that's exactly what they did. In the late seventh century, in the early eighth century, they started inventing these dots. And they found out that if you put one dot above, well, they didn't. They just in, introduce one dot above the letter. It makes a nut. Two dots is a tut. Three dots is a thut. One dot below is a but. Two dots is a yeah. Nut, tut, but yeah. That's five different letters you get just depending on where you put the dots above and below the letter. That's a lot of combination of, of letters, right? You put three letters together with all those different dot, dots, you can get up to 19 different combinations. Then you start adding the vowels, the dama, the kasar, and the fatta. The dama, which would be the oo sound, which is a little curlicue above the letter. The fata, which is the ah vowel. That's a little slash above the letter. And then the kasa, which is the e. That's a little slash below the letter. You have three different vowels and five different dots. You can imagine, you can get up to 33 different, my Al-Fadi, my good friend, has been able to get up to 33 just looking at bite, just looking at those three letters, right. 33 different letters. So what happens when all of a sudden these dots and vowels are put together? Well, you take a script, a skeletal script, and you start making making up your mind as to which dot you're going to put where and which vowels you're going to put where. And what you decide and what I decide are going to be totally different, aren't they? Exactly. Because you can read these words that are in a line to make a sentence, and you can have a sentence that may be 10 words long with as many as 19 different combinations for each word, you can get into tens of tens of tens of different ways of saying that same sentence. Now, people say, yes, the context will shut that down. Yes, you're correct. The context will ameliorate much of that. But there's so many differences of ways of saying things that these different scholars were starting, well, scholars, some of them were scholars and some of them were students. And some of them were students of students. And this is where the different opinions that started to come to a fore in 736. So we're talking about 8th right. century. Muhammad's dead over 100 years now. This has nothing to do with Muhammad. But here's the big confusion. Now, I'm just going to show you this right up here. This is the Kidats. I don't know if you've seen this before. Or I think I've seen that, now. yeah. I got this from Wikipedia, so anybody can get this. Just put Kidat. Q-I-R-A apostrophe A-T, 
put that in Wikipedia and this it'll go right you'll see this graph that are there now I that, of course that's my coloring it's it's not uh, colored like this I've done that but these are the seven that were chosen first okay these seven here and these seven are Nafi look where he's from he's from Medina Ibn Kathir not the man that does the Katafsir this is Ibn Kathir from Mecca Medina Mecca that would be Qureshi right right you would hope anyhow all right Abu Amr from Basra Qureshi nope no Ibn Amr from Damascus Qureshi nope no Asim from Kufa Qureshi nope Hamza from Kufa Qureshi nope Al Qasai from Kufa Qureshi <laughs> are you seeing are you starting to get yeah started? there's a pattern yeah so of these first seven, the most important, these are the first seven that were chosen by Ibn Mujahid. Of the first seven, only two are from Mecca and Medina. We're not even sure they're Qureshi because we're talking about uh, dots and vowels here. Right. There were no dots and vowels when Muhammad was living. Now, what Muslims will tell you, that these seven that were chosen by Ibn Mujahid are the seven that Muhammad was revealed when he was still alive, when Jibril came down because he had only the the Qureshi dialect there were others right. there in the mosque who were heard it differently and they could not understand what he was saying so he asked Jibril to reveal it in six other dialects as Muslims say so when you ask a Muslim okay so that makes seven Qureshi plus six makes seven are these the seven every Muslim a hundred percent that I have asked said yes those are the seven what's the problem with that Tony well, the problem is that you don't have seven distinct readings. You I mean, a whole, a, a whole, but a whole bunch of them. You've got the, you got a couple of them from Kufa. Okay, but uh, don't, worry about, don't worry about Kufa. What's yeah. the problem? Look at the dates, and this is what no one's looking at. Look yeah. at the dates that these were written. Yeah, long the after earliest, Muhammad. The earliest is Ibn Amr from Damascus, seven thirty six. Yeah, Muhammad oh. died in seven thirty two. Uh, six thirty two. Yeah. How many over years? 100, uh, over a hundred years. Exactly. Let's look at another one. Here's one from 738, Ibn Kathir. Kathir, 738. That's over yeah, 100 years. Over 100 Here's years. Nafi, 785. Ooh, tutu, that's 150 years. Yeah. See them here. 770, that's 140 years. 745, again, over 100 mm -hmm. years. 772, over 140 years. Al Qasai, 805. Yeah. yeah. That's the ninth century. Yes. 805, Muhammad died in 632. Can yep. you see this? That's over 170 years later. Right. 175 late. Can you see? No one's bothered to look at the dates. And the dates are not there on Wikipedia. I had to look up each one of these to make sure that I was correct. I had no idea these were so late. Hmm. These are all from 736 up to 805. That's just the first seven. That's just the first seven. But are these all the same? No. No? Have you looked at them? No, not personally, but... Have Muslims looked at them? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't so think they looked at the chosen? dates. How were these chosen? Yeah, yeah. They were chosen by this guy yep. here. Yep, yep. Ibn Long Mujahid. after Muhammad. He chose these. He chose these in 1936. Yeah. That's the 10th century. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He wasn't anywhere near. He's, that's 300 years after Muhammad. He decides to choose seven of them. And those seven become the Kiraat, the readers. But see, three more were added down here seven plus three and yeah. this is abu jafar from medina that possibly is Qureshi. yakub from basra that would be iraq mm -hmm. and khalaf from kufa that would be iraq again iraq yeah so of the 10 that are here of the 10 that are here only three are from mecca and medina the others are all up in the north remember yeah. what 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 we just got done said what up uh, uh what uh, our good friend our good friend uh al buhari said that uthman destroyed all of those from syria and iraq burned them all yeah then how can the first 10 that appear only three of them are from mecca and medina the other seven are all from up north Ooh, doo -doo 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 -doo. yeah no yeah. one's wanted to ask this question it gets worse Notice I've mentioned all these 10 now. These are the 10 kirat. These are the creme de la creme, the best of the best that Yasser Qadi used to always talk about. Right. But these three I just mentioned, when were they chosen? Do you know the date? Uh, I think they're much later. How about, eight, how about 800 years later? Wow. 
Yeah. How about 1429? So we're in the we're now in the medieval period, we're in the we're Middle in Ages. 15th century, we're in the yeah. Ottoman period. This yeah. is an Ottoman who chooses it. Yeah. yeah. 1429, a guy named Al Jazari is the one that chooses these three to add to those seven to make the ten. Wow. Why That's has incredible. this on a timeline? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they now, haven't bothered. Did any of these ten know Muhammad? No. Did any of these ten actually do their work in the century Muhammad did? Nope. Did most of them of the ten even live where Muhammad lived? Most of them, no. No, nope, outside. Of the ten, only uh, seven of them lived up in the north where all the corruption, those are the corrupted areas. Right. What is the most damaging thing that you have noticed? Now, probably you haven't noticed it, so I'll try to help you out. What name is missing amongst those ten? The name that is missing. This one right here. Hmm. Which Quran do I have in my hand here? Uh, I can't see the print there, uh, Jay. This is the one that you use. The Hafs. The Hafs. This the is the Quran, right? The Hafs Quran, yeah. This is the canonical Quran, right? Yep, yep, since 1924. Is, yeah, is it? Did you hear me repeat those names? No, yeah, yeah. I heard you repeat Nafi, the names, but... Nafi, uh, but I'll just repeat uh, real quickly. Nafi, Ibn Kathir, yep. Abu Amr, Ibn Amr, Asim, Hamza, Al-Kisai, Abu Jafar, Yukub, and yep. Khalaf. Do you hear Hafs there? Nope. Bingo. So the one that was chosen in 1924 as the standard, the authoritative one, the one that is going to be the one that is used all over the world that was chosen as the canonical text yep. is not amongst those 10. Right. So where did this come from? Yeah, from Egypt, from nope. uh, 1924. No. Nope. I'm, okay. talking, I'm talking about the canonization. Okay, but yep. when, where did this come from? You don't I, know. Don't I, I, I would place that probably the medi in medieval period. Okay, but... Okay, you won't know the date. 796. And where did it come from? What is the city I've been using more than any other? Uh, I think you've been using mostly, is it Basra or Kuf, Kuf, um, Kufa? Kufa. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Now, here's where it gets really exciting. This comes from Kufa. This comes from 796. Right. Muhammad died in 632. Right. That's 144 years later, right? Yep. Yep. Did this man know Muhammad? No. Did he even live in the century Muhammad lived? No. Nope. Did he live anywhere close to where Muhammad was? No. Nope. Had he ever met Muhammad? No. Nope. So he heard nothing that Muhammad said? Nothing at all. <laughs> <laughs> did he know Uthman? Uh, did he know Uthman? Uh, Uthman would have been 20 years after the whole Uthmanic recension. So I don't think so, no. So 120 years later, he writes what Uthman has in canonized, right? Right. And yet this is the canonical text today. Yeah, that's Those right. Cairo, you were correct, in 1924, made made official for the whole world in 1985 by King Fahd. So yep. it's only been around 36 years as, as, a, as the canonical text. Right. But this, along with 11 others, came from Kufa. 12 of the 30, because there are 30 names here. You notice? Seven here. Yeah. Two, what they call... Uh, transmitters or riwayats. These are riwayats of the Kirats. These are the students. These 14 were added in 1194 by Al Shatibi. That's the 12th century. Yeah. Okay, you get that's just before the Ottomans come to power. That's so right. Dates the Ottomans. So here you then have 7 plus 14 equals 21. These then, that 3 plus their two students for each. That's nine, making it 30. These were added in the 15th century, 1429. So that is 10th century. Mm -hmm. This is 12th century. That's 15th century. It's not till the 15th century that we get all 30. Wow. All 30 chosen from how many? Right. Right. You know the answer to that one? You probably don't. Go ahead. This is why... Shadi Nasser has been such a boon for us. He is the uh, uh, he is the professor there at Harvard University who has yep. done his doctorate on this. He looks he's looking at five different canons of the Quran, and he's looking at the first canon would be the Uthmanic canon. He's not written a book about it because he's obviously there's nothing to write. There's nothing right. there from Uthman. He's then the book that just came out last November is the first second canon, which is the canon of Al -Mujah, Ibn Mujahid from the 10th century, and that's where he's done all the damage. 
And then the third cannon would be, of course, shot, uh, shot the Beast cannon, which is the 14 students to come after the seven readers. And then the fourth cannon would be al Jazidi, who then in 1429 brings another nine to add to the previous 21 to get 30. That's in the 15th century. And then, of course, the fifth cannon that he talks about would be uh, the one you just referred to earlier, the 1924 cannon by right. Al-Husseini Al-Haddad there in Cairo. So five right. different cannons, five different periods, that five different sets of Qurans were then uh, canonized. So now we have 30 Qurans by the 15th century. 30 different yep. Qurans. Why yep. is nine here? Those are nine. Those are nine. Right. But the two most important are these two right here. These are by far the most popular. This one here is the Warsh. This one here is the Hafs. This one here is the one you've been talking about. And these are both yep. Arabic Qurans. These are complete 114 surahs, 6,236 verses each. All right? Mm -hmm. If you look at these two Qurans, this one is the one that was became very popular all over the world. This is now memorized. It's for memorization, memorized by about 95% of all Muslims in the world today. Right. This one is memorized by about 3% of the world, Muslim world's population. This is very popular in North Africa. Right. This is Warsh. Warsh died in 812. Hafs died in 796. So not too much difference between these no. two. No. About 16 years between these two. But certainly a huge difference after Muhammad. These two books represent two different ways of memorizing the Quran. If you look and um, compare these two, there are 5,000 words different. Right. Let me repeat right. that. 5,000 words that are different. Right. Right. So when Muslims say there's not one difference between one word and one letter, what are they going to do with just these two books? This is two right. of 30. That we of 30. Have. And you can buy them on the internet. I just bought these last summer, a year ago. Right. In, here in Illinois, in the United States. Right. Can, they're, they're still being published. Why are they still being published in 2021? Yeah, and and I know that at Speaker's Corner in London, when you uh, and your your friends uh, uh, showed them, the Muslims were actually trying to grab them from you. Uh, and, and so when you raised up all those different Qurans, uh, the Muslims realized, uh, in a sense, the jig was up. So folks, there's the picture. I, I want you guys to realize what Dr. Smith's been talking about here. The Muslim mantra, the common mantra you keep hearing is that the Quran is the same Quran that Muhammad revealed. And unlike your Bibles that have all these variants in it, the Quran has no variants at all. It is a homogenous text that's come down to us. And so when Dr. Smith, you could see that on YouTube, look at uh, Speaker's Corner uh, the uh, on the Qurans. Uh, they showed all those Qurans and the Muslims were actually trying to take that uh, from them. But very quickly, let me just show you, and I know you alluded to this, uh, Jay, earlier, but here I have a copy of the uh, Nessel Allen uh, 28 edition of the Greek New Testament. And you'll notice you've got the Greek text here at the top. This is the Greek text. And you'll notice at the bottom, we have what's called the critical apparatus. And it'll show you the various variants that are in the Greek text. Christians have known this for 400 years. We know about these various textual differences. And we know that the more manuscripts you have, the more textual variants you're going to have. And so Christians have always been honest. And so have the Jews. If you look at the Masoretic text, they have a critical apparatus as well, where they show you what there's differences in the Hebrew uh, text, uh, what's called the Kare what, what you what, what, uh, what you read and how it should be read. So Jews and Christians have been open about this. We have been transparent about this. But our Muslim friends, if you notice, and I think you'll back me up on this too, Jay, there is no critical edition of the Quran in the sense of there being a Quranic text with a critical apparatus underneath that. Is that correct, Jay? Yes. That we and have no critical apparatus. Why is that? How were these chosen? Right. How did Ibn Mujahid, al Shatibi, and al Jazidi, those are the three that chose the 30 different Qurans. And I say different. Yeah. Every one of them is different. There are 93,000 differences that we have just found by looking only 23 of them. There are another, we still have another seven to go. Right. If we have been able, just us, not Muslims. Muslims are not doing this. We're doing right. it for them. Yeah. Because Muslims refuse to do this. But how did they choose? How did Al, Al um, Ibn Mujahid or Al Shatabi or Al Jazari, how did they come to their conclusion on how they chose these different Kirats and Riwayats? Do you know how they did it? 
Go ahead, Jerry. We want to hear it from you. This, Tony, how would you want them to choose it? How would I want them to choose it? I would, well, I, chosen yeah, they, yeah, they chose it based on various uh, principles or rules of interpretation. And that is, we want to get back to the original. Our intent is to get back to the original writing. And so we will. We would analyze the manuscripts. We would look at. Okay, okay. stop. We, say that again. Yeah. You would do what? We would analyze the manuscripts. Okay, hold on a minute. What do you mean by that? Well, we would compare them. We look at the manuscripts, and we would we would look at the textual differences. Ah, and we, and we would try. Stay yeah, there. stay right there. So you would open up the books. Right. You would open them up and read the the Greek or the Hebrew, right? Right. Or in this case, they would have opened the books and looked at the Arabic, right? Right. They didn't open one page. Right. Not one page was opened by uh, Al Ibn Mujahid, by Al Shatabi, by Al Jazari. Not one word was looked at. Not one sentence was looked at. Right. Are you aware of this? Yes. Yes, I'm aware of that. So, how did they choose those thirty? What was uh, their criteria for choosing the first seven, and then the next fourteen, and then the next nine? What was their criteria? Do you know what their criteria I'm was? I'm not too not too uh, read up on that part, but please go ahead, Jay. Let us know. Well, Tony, how would you do it? If you did open the text, if you did yeah. open up the book and you didn't read one word, how would you choose them then if you were in their place? If I was in their place, how would I choose what I believe to be the original? The seven originals? Yeah. The yeah. Follow? I would try to go to the one that goes closest to Muhammad. Okay. So by date, you'd go by date. Correct. Sure. Yeah. Date. Please? These yeah. are dated from 736 all the way up to 844. Right. Two, two, two. Yeah. You're talking about 8th, 9th, and 10th century. Uh, yeah. Sorry, 8th and 9th century. Yeah. Yeah. The, is that how you do it? Well, there are 700 to choose from. All the other 700. Amongst the 700, only 30 were chosen. Why didn't right. you choose the other 600 and, uh, excuse me, 670? Well, yeah, I mean, I think this. Six hundred seventy only keeps yeah, these. 30. Yeah, I mean, was it chosen by? Was it chosen by uh, imperial imperial decree? <laughs> what What do you mean imperial decree? Well, whoever was in charge. The like, How did the, 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 the decree? I'll just keep back him. How did the imperial decree be, choose them? Well, I'm I'm just going based on whoever would have been the the leader of the empire at the time. The leader. How did the leader choose them? In? I'm just going to keep backing you up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, how would the leader choose them? I guess uh, he would either have to go with whatever uh, suited his interests, I would assume. <laughs> Can you see how this just gets worse? And oh, worse? no. It gets worse and worse the more you Shari try Nasser to look into it. how they chose them. And what Shadi Nasser says, every one of these was chosen by popularity. It had nothing to do so, with... So it was a popularity vote. It was a popularity as to who had the most students. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> Whoever had the most students must be the most authoritative. Therefore, he was chosen. And in some cases, when there was more than one student that was popular in the same city, they then chose, in fact, this guy here, Warsh, was, had not the most students. He was not the most popular. He right. was chosen because they had so many from Kufa already. They needed somebody from Cairo. They had no one else from Cairo, and he was from Cairo, so they chose him. So it had right. everything to do with popularity and geography. It had nothing to do with textual criticism. Wow. So they're not interested in, in no. going back to the to the earliest form of the text. Can you see then why? Wow. Yasser Qadi, when he was asked this question by Muhammad Hijab. Yes. I want to show you this, and I held this up. This is the same day that we held up the 26 different Qurans. Back in 2016, that was five years ago, we held up those 26 Qurans, all collected by Hatun Tash, only five foot two. Yeah. She is getting a real beating right now. Yeah. Yes. Her on your show. Yes. She is amazing. An amazing. Yeah, she'll be on my show in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Okay. When, and you need to ask her this question Who is this guy right here? That's Muhammad Hijab. That's Muhammad Hijab. He yeah. was in the crowd. Yeah. He yeah. Was right there watching. He goes outside the crowd and says, Everybody come here. Everybody just leave. Yeah. Watch. Don't look at what they're showing you. Don't listen to what they were saying. They are lying. They are lying. They're lying. Come to me. Come to me. Come to me. And I will explain this. Right. Right. So he's going to explain this, right? 2016. Let's now jump to 2020. 2020, a year ago, June 8th. He's explained this completely to all his disciples, right? Right. And he has about a half a million disciples now on YouTube. 
So he goes to the number one uh, authority on the Quran who got his doctorate at Yale University on the Quran, Dr. Yasser Qadi. I've got his yep. picture. Dr. Yasser Qadi. That's a yep. right Yeah. That's Dr. Yasser Qadi. Here is Muhammad Hijab. This right. is the interview right here. Yep. This is the interview that they had a year ago, June 8, 2020. Right. And he decides since after five, four years now, it's obvious he has not been able to explain this to his students, right? That's right. 2016, 2020, he says to Dr. Yasser Qadi, he doesn't know we're all watching. He didn't know that we were going to fo follow this. He didn't know that we were going to see this interview. I didn't know that I was going to see this interview. Uh, it was Islam cr critique that got me and says, Jay, have you, are you looking at this interview? And I yeah. watched it and I was gobsmacked <laughs> because here I saw Muhammad Hijab, who represents, I would suggest, 99% of all Muslims. He yep. is a populist form of Islam. He is not academic. He has no degree behind his name. He is nothing more than an internet jockey. Yeah. He is a populist. He yep. is a radical Muslim. Listen, I know him. I've debated him. I've been with him. I've confronted him for four years so there at Speaker. Well, maybe, maybe it was more like three years. And he was, you know, he's six foot seven. When I'm on the ladder and he stands next to my ladder, his head's right next to mine. That's yeah. how tall he is. And I, you know, this guy just does not know his material. He is, you can run circles around him. So it was obvious when he came to Yasser Qadi a year ago, he wanted an answer because he knew that he did not know what to do with these different get -ons. And so he asked a very simple question, Dr. Qadi. If I put my hand out here and I have a blank sheet of paper here, which one are you going to write in there? Before he could answer, before he could even get that sentence out, Yasser Qadi shut him down. I remember. Don't talk about this in public, he said. Yes. Do not ask me this question in public. Not on camera. Now I'm paraphrasing here because, I don't, because of for shortness of time. And then he says, we do not know what to do with this. For a thousand years, this has been the most difficult question. Yet isn't this the same Yasser Qadi who has said over and over again, the Quran is exactly the same. There is not one word, not one letter difference. That's isn't right. he the same? Yes, We've he heard is. it hundreds of times. Yes. Isn't he the one that has been the bastion of preservation of yes. the Quran? Yes, he has. So Muhammad Hijab is asking a perfectly innocent question, sure. a question that he didn't know how to answer four years ago when we introduced it back at Speaker's Corner. And I sat there and I watched Yasser Qadi, and I looked at, just look at his nonverbals. You could see he was uncomfortable. He did not want to answer. You can go up and look at it. We, we've grabbed that video, and I've got it on my site. You can go and see the whole all 28 minutes or the seven minutes. He, Muhammad Hijab persisted, and he says, it, was this the crisis of faith you had back at Yale University in 1995? No, 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 no. Yes, Akadi says. Not a crisis of faith, a crisis of knowledge. Mm -hmm. What an admission. Yeah. And then he went into a mantra. I am absolutely sure that the Quran is preserved. I am absolutely sure that Allah has preserved it. I am absolutely sure. It, and he goes, it's like a mantra, this memorized yeah. mantra he went into. You can hear him do it. This is what he has been doing, has been saying. This is what he has memorized since he was knee high to a grasshopper. Every month, every Muslim, and I call it the Islamic dance. It's the Muslim dance. It's a dance right. they go into. Whatever they're unsure, they just start repeating what they've memorized or what they've been told. And this is exactly what he did. Mm. Muhammad Yajab was not satisfied. He said, This should be an easy answer for you. Yasir Qadi turns to him and he says, You, in the East, are not, do, not in the same position that I am in the West. I live in Houston. I went to Yale University. I represent Western Islam. I live in a different world than you do, he was saying. Yeah. You, you, who have the standard Islamic narrative, the standard Islamic narrative has holes in it. That's right. What a comment to make. Yeah. Standard narrative has holes in it. And that the West, where I live and where I have to work and where I have to engage in academia here, the scholars in these universities here have come leaps and bounds in the last hundred years. Yes, yes. And they're looking at us like an effort with no clothes on. What a happened? Yeah, yeah. Fine. And, and he said, Jay, that Western scholars have done the job that we should have done. They've, they're the ones that are bringing this out. Not the Muslim scholars. It's the Western scholars that are bringing this out. And then he said fascinating thing. He said... In the West, they are not like us. We, when we look at the Quran, we have a reverence for the Quran. We have a right. respect for the Quran. 
And we have certain red lines beyond which we don't go. There are certain questions we don't ask this book. Red line he used. Right. Let me just show you. Basically, this is what he was saying. We have a red line. There's the red line right there. Do you see it? Yep. Yep. That's the red line that Muslims are not permitted to ask. Westerners can ask any in line they want to. We don't have red line. Tony, when you do your courses, when you teach, do you have a red line? Do you have, say, certain questions I won't nope. ask? No. Nope. Are there any red lines in our Western universities? No, nope. none at all. In fact, isn't that why the Western universities are so popular and why people come from all over the world to study? Isn't that why in the top 10, six of them are in the United States alone? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Why, are absolutely. They, why is it in Europe, in the United States, we, sub, we dominate in every category on every subject in all our universities? Yeah, we're not afraid of the critical questions. We want to probe and probe and probe and probe. Tony, what not it so that redacted criticism, source criticism, historical criticism, textual criticism have been applied and done against the Bible for the last hundred years? Yes. Yeah. And would they you, originated in the West. They originated in the West. Okay. And they would, they, they didn't originate on the Bible, but certainly they have matured all these historical critical analysis and these yes. have all been matured because of the Bible. Am I correct? Correct. That's absolutely correct. No other book has gone through the same critical analysis that the Bible has. That's correct. Absolutely. I don't know any. I don't know of any that has begun to, including, as you just admitted about 10 minutes ago, the Quran has not even had this. And That's as right. you can see, when they chose these, this had nothing to do with his textual criticism and had nope. to do with popularity. That's not how you choose a authoritative, credible book. Exactly. He went on and said, and this is what was fascinating. We have a red line beyond which we don't go. But at Yale, there are no red lines. That's right. And that's where he had this crisis of knowledge. Suddenly, he was hearing questions posed by very legitimate scholars here in the West that he had never heard in any of his studies. And you will not hear in any curriculum of any Arab or any Indian or Pakistani or any Indian subcontinent, any Muslim university, you won't hear these questions. You are not permitted because of this respect they have, this red line. That's right. Go beyond. But what did he say? When converts come, we don't tell them about this. When Muslims have been, a, been for a number of years, we just say, just accept it. Don't question it. Right. For those who are advanced, then we do a deep dive. dive. Remember that? Right. Yep. Yep. Take my class. Yeah. <laughs> but you have to take my class. And yeah. then he completely contradicted himself because then he says, I have never done one talk on this subject in 25 years. I've never spoken on this. Yeah. He yeah. tells Muhammad Hijab to take his class. Isn't that a contradictory it's statement? In, indeed, absolutely, absolutely. But but uh, Jade, I want to just share here for a minute. Maybe you can comment on this. I'm going to share a screen here, and I just wanted to look at. Uh, I want us to look at uh, an example uh, of the uh, the sauna uh, manuscript, and I'm just going to put this on the screen. You can see it, Jade. Yeah. Okay, so folks, just very quickly, uh, Palimpsest is basically a manuscript that's been washed and written over, and so. What you have here, this was discovered in Sana, okay? And what you have is uh, a, 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 uh, a copy from a, a part of the Quran. What you see in the faded letters here, this is what is the lower text. This was rubbed or scrubbed off, and then they wrote above it. Now, the lower text, the lower text is approximately 73% of the standard text we have today. That's the Hoff's text that Dr. Smith was talking about. And even after all the corrections, Wait, you still... Can by 73% of the text. Right, right. What do you mean by that? And, and so, well, this, this 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 is from Dr. Powers, Dr. Bernie Powers. That is correct. Let me just correct that real quickly. Okay, so this is Dr. Powers. Go ahead. There are only 70 verses in the lower text. There are 6,000 verses in the Quran itself. So how can right. you this is only this is 73%? Yeah, yeah, this is Dr. Well, yeah, this is Dr. Uh, Powers' uh, text. So That's I'll probably incorrect. have to send him a correction on that or tell him Make to check sure it out. Correct that. Cause remember, Absolutely. And what you're looking at here has nothing to do with the Kid'ah, by the way. We're going to a right. whole subject now. Yeah, yeah. We're just trying to show that there are def definitely different readings. Um, so here's just some examples. Let me, let me clarify something. Please yeah, don't go ahead. You're confusing the issue, Hugh. This okay. is nothing to do with readings here. Right. What you're looking at here are the razm. Are you familiar yeah. with the word razm? Yeah, this the consonantal text. This is what Dan Brubaker is working on. 
This right. is what Al Fadi is working on. This right. is what our scholars are now working on, and they're completely just they're good. They have yet to really publish what they now know. But this one was done by uh, uh, was looked at by uh, Adel uh, Abel uh, Fadeli. I just got her book here. Okay. Asma Hilali, sorry. Asma Hilali. This is the book you're looking at. Okay. This is the book that that came out in 2017, which goes into what you're looking at. And she is the only one that has ever published on this. Why is it that hundreds have not published on this when this is proving to be the oldest text, the oldest manuscript? Right. The upper text you're looking at is dated to 705. The lower text is from the 7th century. It is only 70 verses. And I'm sorry, it's only 61, 63 verses, but there are 70 different variants in those 63 verses from the upper text. Right. right. What does that tell you? Well, it tells us we got a serious problem with the narrative that this Quran has always been the same. There's obviously been changes in the text, in the in the continental text. Let me show you this one here. This is the Musaf. This is from Topkapa. Yeah. Go ahead yeah. and stop sharing so they can see this. Yeah. Okay. Just give me a minute. This, this is also one of the six major manuscripts right here. Okay. And this one here is dated to the mid eighth century. Just say, just hit stop share on your on your yep. screen. Yeah, I'm just looking for that right now. Be at the bottom. Okay, there we go. Go ahead. Now this one here has ninety seven percent or ninety eight percent of the Quran in it. Right. It has no dots. I lie. It has some dots have been added in at a later date in red. So it's obviously been they've been added in the eighth or ninth century or said ninth or tenth century. But it doesn't have dots and it has no vowels. Now, this one, which is considered to be the best of all the manuscripts. See, the Sana manuscript is not even, it, it's only about 26% of the Quran. The bottom text is only, we're only talking about 63 verses. Right. The upper text is only 23% uh, of the Quran. This one is 98% of the Quran. It is being dated now to about 749. So you're talking about the time the Abbasids come to power. And yet, even this manuscript has 2,230 variants. These are consonant right. variants. These are not, right. this has nothing to do with dots. This has nothing to do with the Kira differences, okay? We're talking about two different arguments here. But right. if the Quran has been preserved, and yet even the earliest manuscripts, like the Sana you're looking at there, you're looking at, you can go to the Ma'il manuscript, that one is only 20, that's only about 50% of the Quran. You're looking also at the Husseini manuscript, which has hundreds upon hundreds of coverings where they've covered yep. over. And then they've completely changed and manipulated the text after they've covered it over. You're looking also at the Petropolis manuscript, which is in Paris. That one is actually only about 20% of the Quran. I've got some of them right here. In fact, I've got them. I should have showed them to you. Look at this one right here. These are so huge. This is the Petropolis right here. The entire Petropolis I've got right in this. It's so big. I I, I break my back. <laughs> But can you see it has it has no yep. dots and it has no vowel. Yeah. Let me show you right. the right. Right. Backwards, so I put it up there. I it's see it. Continental text. So this is the one that François de Roche has done his work on. And François de Roche is the world authority. He's probably the most authoritative one. Here's another one I want to show you here. Oh man, these are bright backbreaking. Yeah. This is the one I'm most familiar with. This is the one that's in London in the, at the British Museum. Okay. British Library, I'm sorry. This is the Mutyl, the 2165 manuscript. Right. Take a look at it. Do you notice it's a different script than what, what you've been looking at? Yes, very much. What's different about it? It, it, it looks, well, it looks almost, it's 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 cursive. It's it's not only cursive, but it's lacking the diacritical points as well. It looks like it's a, a skeletal, a skeletal text as well. Skeletal it's called Mutyl, which means it's a slanted text. It's a Hijazi text script. Right. Which which precedes the Kufic text that you were looking at earlier. So all of this is Kufic. So this would be a later script. Right. This is a much more stylized script. Also, right. it doesn't have any of the diacritical marks, and it doesn't have any of the vowelization. The Sana that you're looking at, the Sana manuscript, this one here, this is the Sana. Let me get some pages of it to show you what I'm talking about. As I'm talking about it, I'll just continue to say the Sana manuscript is really problematic because not only does it have that lower script, it has been carbon dated. Mm. And the carbon datings from four different labs in four different cities in Europe, Deal in uh, Germany, Zurich in Switzerland, 
the Lyon Laboratory in France and also the Oxford Laboratory in Britain where the Birbringham folio was carbon dated. Right. They carbon dated the Sanaa manuscript and guess what the dates they found for the Sanaa manuscript. What was that? 393 to 500. Wow. Why do you say wow? Wow, I didn't know that. I but didn't, what I that didn't know that. What's the problem with those dates? Well, they're, they're quite late. They're from, quite early. Uh, from, you may, are you referring to Muhammad's death? From Muhammad's death? This is the Quran, remember? 393 yep. to 500. When was Muhammad born? He was born 570. When did he die? 632. When was the Quran finalized? 652. Right. 393 to 500 is too early, isn't it? Oh, I see what you're saying. Right. Before there Muhammad. Hundreds of years it's before, it's the before Quran. he even existed. Yeah. Exactly. So how yeah. can you have a Quran? Yeah. A manuscript that was from 393 to 500 if the Quran even doesn't even begin to be revealed from 610 to 630 right. is not written down to 652. Right. No, I see what you're saying. Yeah. I thought you meant 300 years after the death of Muhammad. You meant 393, 393 of the Common Era, AD. 393 AD. Gotcha. 500 AD. <laughs> wow. So, so you've got you've got you've got a pre-Quran, a Quran before the Quran. Bingo. <laughs> so, and and that applies to the Birmingham that? folios too, right, Jay? The Bir Birmingham folios as well, right? Birmingham folios 568 to 645. Ma yeah. The Quran. First of all, Muhammad was born in 570, and yeah. then he dies in 632. So this covers his whole life. But right. it's seven years before the Quran was even canonized, was even yeah. written down. And the problem is, take a look at those three stories that are in the Birmingham folio. They go from Surah 18, 19, and 20. None of them are have to do with Islam. They have right. to. They they have to do with the seven sleepers of Ephesus. That is from, that is from 200 AD. They have to right. do with. The writings of Jacobus, which is from 400 AD, and they have to do with the story of Moses out of the Bible, which has to do with 1400 BC. Right. So you're looking at three different stories that all predate Islam, predate Muhammad. These are in Arabic, but they're in Nabataean Aramaic. Wow. Nabataean Aramaic is way up in Jordan. Right. It's the wrong Arabic. Right, right. No one's, no one's talking about this. The Quran yeah. itself, all these manuscripts we're looking at. These manuscripts, they have the Tarmat Buddha. They have the Aleph Maksura. They have also the definite article. That did not exist in any yeah. Arabic that was from Medina and Mecca because Medina and Mecca used Sabaic Arabic, which did not use the Tarmat Buddha, did not have the Aleph Maksura, did not have the definite article. These endings and these beginnings of the words, that was all Nabataean Aramaic, which is 600 miles further north. Ooh, right. And so now we're, now we're, now we're coming up with the, the whole the question of the Qibla, that the Qibla was not really Mecca, but was, was Petra. And it's raising up the whole question by other scholars. And I think you would probably hold the same position that Muhammad was a, was a created figure. He was a conjectural figure that was created later by the Arab empire. And it sounds a lot like whatever this is, it sounds like a, uh, a, a heretical uh, anti-Nicene form of Christianity. Bingo, you've got it. So when Abdul Malik introduces the name Muhammad on the Dome of the Rock, he introduces it on the coins, he introduces it on the Caliph Protocols in 691 and 692, that name had not been found written anywhere on any other text, on any coins, on any inscriptions earlier than that. So that is wow. the late 7th century, he introduces it. What do you think he was introducing, or better yet, who do you think he was introducing? Uh, Abdul Malik? Yeah. He rules from 685 to 705. Yeah. He well, Damascus. Yeah, yeah. Well, based on the the inscriptions on on the Dome of the Rock, they all seem to be talking about Jesus, his divinity. Right? They're attacking. Yes. His divinity. They're attacking his divinity. Who yes. was attacking Jesus' divinity in the late seventh century? These would have been uh, these would have been heretics. These would and, have been Christian heretics who were yes. internecine. This is a an internecine Christian squabble that was going yes. on in that part of the world. And why does Abdul Manik, who's living way up in Damascus, why does he build the Dome of the Rock, the largest building of its kind anywhere in the world, the most splendor look at, splendorous looking building with yeah. Byzantine architecture, yeah. right in the middle of Jerusalem, looking down on the Church of the Sepulchre? Yeah. Why didn't he build it down in Petra, where his sanctuary was? Why didn't he build it in Damascus, where he lived, where his political capital was? Right. He has nothing to do with Jerusalem. He doesn't care diddly swat about Jerusalem because his greatest threat were Byzantine Christianity. Right.
And where did the Byzantine Christians go for pilgrimage? They Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And what yeah. did the Byzantine Christians have that Abdul Malik, who was an Arab, who was an Abrahamist, but he comes from the line of Ishmael, what did they have that he doesn't have? What did they have? The Byzantine Christians? And the Jews. Well, they, well, they had the Bible. They had the New Testament. They, so they had the manuscripts. And they have a prophetic line. That's right? right. That's right. But the Arabs who now control the whole area, remember, by the time Abdul Malik comes to power, they control all the way from Tripoli in the west all the way to Afghanistan in the east. They are now the big superpower alongside the only other superpower that could compete with them are the Byzantines. They're right. Christians. Jews, right. who cares about the Jews? They're not political power. Remember, this is politics, 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 politics. Yeah. What do you do as a politician to confront your greatest rival? You go and you slap the biggest building of its kind right in the middle of your holiest city, Jerusalem, which is Abrahamist. Yeah. Both Ishmael and Isaac go back to Abraham. These are your cousins, but they have a prophetic line which you don't. They have scripture which you don't. So what you do, you then introduce all these inscriptions on the inner ambulatory which attack his Jesus. They're all attacking Jesus. They're attacking his divinity. Right. They're attacking the Trinity. They're attacking his sonship. And they're introducing the Shahada. There's only one God but God. So you take out this whole, you attack this whole idea of polytheism and you introduce monotheism. There is only one God but uh, Allah. And then yeah. you add another phrase, and he has no associates. That's not part of the Shahad today. No. Nope. That's attacking Christians as well. Mm -hmm. And Muhammad is his messenger. Yeah. Servant. But what does Muhammad mean? What is it, Muhammad? Yeah, mean? Muhammad means the praised one. And the praised one. Known as the praised one in all the Syro Aramaic uh, references. All the Syri Syriac and Syria Aramaic references, the praise one is who? In Jesus. All those, it's Jesus. always Jesus. So is this Jesus or is this the man named Muhammad? Aha. Uh -huh. It sounds like a title for Jesus rather than exactly. a proper name. Because everything else is about Jesus. Right. So why is it suddenly we assume that this is a man named Muhammad? Yeah. When yeah. he hasn't appeared, this man has a name, has not appeared on any coin. Look at all the inscriptions. Over 70,000 inscriptions, 30,000 of, of them have already been translated. They're all in the north. They're all in the south. Not one of these inscriptions are in the middle part of Arabia. All the coins, they're all in the north. They're all in the south. Not one coin has been found in the middle part of Arabia. Look at all the trade. It's in the north. It's in the south. Not one trade route is found in the middle part of Arabia. Look at the kingdoms. All the kingdoms from the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, all the way. Sorry, the third, fourth, and uh, third, second, and first BC, all the way up to sixth century BC. Look at all the kingdoms. They're all in the north. They're in what we call Arab Petraea. Right. Nothing's in Arab Deserta. Why is it called Arabia Deserta? Because it's desert. Right. There's absolutely nothing there. And the yeah. reason there's absolutely nothing there, there's no water. If there's no water, there's no fertilization. There's no vegetation. If there's no vegetation, there's no trade. Why right. has nobody looked at this? Look at the yeah. Look at the maps and then put it on a timeline. We're doing yeah. that. Now, and, he, and even the Dome on the Rock, uh, Jay, as you've noted as well before, there's something missing in that in that dome. And there's a Qibla that's missing, isn't there? <laughs> Except for this. The Qibla is not there, but right next to the Dome of the Rock is the, the Dome of the Chain, which is built the same time. That has a Qibla. What's on the southern wall, right in front of the dome, on the southern wall, is the Alexa Mosque, built in yes. 709. That right. has a Qibla. Where is the Qibla in the Alexa Mosque, and where is the Qibla in the Dome of the Chain? Right next to it. It's that little small mosque right next to it. Right. Where are they pointing? I would say, are they pointing to Petra? Absolutely. Dead in Jordan, onto Petra in Jordan, because that is the Umayyad. That is the Umayyad sanctuary. That would be Abdul Malik sanctuary. So when he builds it, he he knows exactly what he's doing. So why and where did Mecca come into importance? We could go on for another hour on this. Yeah, we, yeah. we need to get to the Quran. But then, can you understand that these Quranic? This is the first Quranic text we can find anywhere, or is on the Dome of the Rock. Isn't that interesting? Right. That and it and, and does it differ? From the uh, the Hof's text, I think in some places. Absolutely, it I gave you one right now. La ila illa, there's no associates and Muhammad Rasulullah. What's that? No associates. That's not part of the Shahada. That's not there and in, no. in, uh, in the Quran. So obviously, even the Shahada in the Quran is not complete. There is no complete Shahada in the Quran. Isn't that fascinating? Yes, it's split up, which suggests even the Quran didn't have the Shahada when it was finally written. But 
as you start to look at Surah 112, as you start to look at Surah 4, 171, which is in on the Dome of the Rock, on those inscriptions, you can see that there are variants. So it looks like the, the, Quran, the Quranic material that is there on the Dome of the Rock has been lifted from somewhere, then introduced into the Quran in the 8th and 9th century, changing it, ameliorating it. So where was it introduced? And this is why this guy here is so important, where I had him here. This guy right here. Yo, I don't know if you've seen this book. Christoph Luxemburg's book on the syro aramaic reading of the Quran. This no, guy is becoming... Yeah, I know the author. I've read his other works. Is that, when did that come out, Jay? When was that published? Actually, this came out back in 2007. 2007. Okay. Okay. I've that, read some of his other works. Yeah. 14 years. It is just destroying this idea. Because when you look and see what he is saying, in order to understand the Quran, you need to go back to the Syriac. Because almost all of the Quranic material comes out of syro aramaic texts. These are Christian texts. This is nothing new to Christians. It's all Christian texts that have been lifted and introduced into the Quran. But in doing that, they deformed it here, and they deformed it there, and that's why 20% of the Quran Muslims cannot understand today. Did you know that? 20% of the guests yes. understand. Even the scholars can't understand. Well, if they go back to the Syriac, you can understand it. And he gives example, right. example after example after example where you can understand it. And the word Quran is Syriac as well, right, Jay? If, so if, you, if our, our hearers, I want you guys, our, our viewers, please notice this. The word Quran itself is Syriac. It's not Arabic. It was brought into the Arabic language. And yeah. so... An awful lot of the words are Syriac. The yeah. The yeah. All of these words, there's, there, there are words from all over, but what needs to be, what we need to underline is much of the Quran has been, in fact, almost all of the Quran, except for the prophetic, uh, except for the life of Muhammad, which is very little of the Quran, all the theology, theological concepts, all the ideas, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the pre-Islamic are all the, the material that is biblical. All of it is either borrowed from Jewish apocryphal writings, which we've talked about many yep. times before. Yep or it's borrowed from these Syriac heretical writings. And it's that milieu that's happening there. Remember, this is all happening in northern Syria and northern Jordan, northern Iraq. This is all what we now know today as Mesopotamia and also Syria, Iraq, and Jordan. That's where all this is being played out. And that's where all these groups are fighting and jiving, jiving with each other. And yeah. look at where Abdul Malik's palace is, where his political capital is. It's in Damascus. If he was a Muslim, what is, why isn't he way down in Medina and Mecca? Right. Because there was no Mecca. There was a Medina, but it wasn't called Medina. It was called Yathrib. It was nothing more than a little town. In fact, even over in Iraq, Kufa was nothing more than a little town. If Kufa was a little town and continued to be a little town, maybe about at the most ten to 20,000 people, how is it you get of the 30 Kira'ats that we talked about half an hour ago, 20, I'm going to say 12 of them, 12 of them come from just Kufa. How can you get 12 different dialects in a little town of 20,000 people in just a period of 50 to 60 years? Yeah. Dialects take hundreds of years to form. Can you have that many dialectical differences? And when you look at the differences, al Qadi and I are now doing that. We're going through this, these two different kiddots, the Hafs and the Warsh. Mm -hmm. We're looking at the Hafs and we're looking at the Warsh and we're looking at all the 5,000 differences. We've only got through about seven or eight. We're going to be doing this for years to come. And right. we're comparing them. And this has nothing to do with dialect. It has nothing to do with pronunciation. It has everything to do with completely different words, completely different meanings, completely different. In some cases, different beliefs, some cases, different doctrines, and in some cases, different practices. Now, nobody has done this yet. We're the first to do it. Al-Fadi is a native Arab speaker from yep. Saudi Arabia, from Jeddah himself. Yep. This guy is getting his doctorate in this area. That's why you can't get any better than Al-Fadi on this material. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to I'm gonna have Al-Fadi on, I think, in a week or two. He's going to be on uh, my channel. So you guys want to look out for that. Al-Fadi's a, a, a convert from Islam as well. He's a, he's a Christian. But uh, as you can see, folks, uh, Dr. Smith has been doing this, I, I mean, since I've known him. He's been a researcher in this particular area. And this stuff is lethal to Islam. For 26 uh, years, I've been working on this material. Yeah, 26 years. And um, I would recommend you check the description box. I've put uh, Dr. Smith's uh, YouTube channel connection there. Dr. Smith also teaches, along with Dr. Daniel Brubaker and others, he also teaches courses on Islam 
for uh, postgraduate students and also undergraduates. And also uh, there's audit students and there's also students who just wanna learn just to expand their knowledge. So maybe uh, Jay, you can share a little bit about that if students are interested in learning more about Islam and uh, coming at it from a, I guess uh, an elementary uh, 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 approach and then moving forward. Can, maybe you can tell them a little bit about the, the ministry. What, what we're doing is uh, Veritas International University in California approached me about a year and a half ago, if I would put together a master's program and a doctoral program just on polemics and apologetics to Islam. Now, there's no school in the world that teaches apologetics and polemics to Islam. This is the first to do so. And I said, I would be more than willing to do so. I'll get five. We have five professors. I'm the one that directs it. Dr. Daniel Janasik is my uh, is my administrator and also co-teacher on many of the courses. We have Al-Fadi is one of the teachers. Dr. Daniel Brubaker is going to start his course on Monday, mm -hmm. teaching just on the Quran. And then we have Dr. Sassan Tavasoli. So four of us have doctorates. The Al-Fadi is about to get his doctorate. So we all have doctorates all in our specific areas of Islam. What we're doing is we're teaching this. We're not in California. We're actually on Zoom like we're doing right now. So this right. can be done anywhere in the world. You can just sit at your home and get your degree. But you don't have to get it if you don't want to get credit for it, if you don't want to get a master's or a doctorate for this. You can do it and audit it, and you can get a certificate of audit. And so we have about 20 students, or maybe maybe more than that by now, who are going to start on Monday on down Dr. David uh, Daniel uh, Brubaker's course. I had about 40 students just do my course on the origins. But many of them are audit students. If you want to get a certificate, that costs about $280 for the course. There are 10 courses to get the degree. This is just one that we're talking about. So each course has 10 lectures. If you want to also just do it as personal enrichment, those of you, many of you who are on the field, I know a lot of missionaries like this. They don't have the time uh, to actually read all the books or do the tests or write the papers. They just want to learn the material. That's personal enrichment. The course costs $185. You get all the lectures. You get the recordings of the lectures so you can watch it when you're free. You don't have to watch it from 8 to 10 Eastern Standard Time, our time uh, here in Toronto and also down here on the East Coast. But also you get all the PowerPoints and that's what most people want. They want the PowerPoints because that unpacks it. We have everything we teach, we PowerPoint, and then we send you the PowerPoints. So that is all being done uh, we've already we we now are on our fifth course of ten courses. We'll be doing another course starting in September. That would be the history of Islam, uh, to be taught by Dr. Daniel Janasik. Then I'm repeating the origins course. It was so popular when I taught it in March that we're doing it again in October. And this time I will be in California teaching it live. So if anybody wants to come to California and to Veritas International University, show up. But you need to register first, and you have to be a Christian. Let me repeat this. This is only for Christians. Now, I know we've been advertising this on our YouTube channels, and we've been getting a lot of headaches. People are really upset that this is not open to everybody. We have to make sure this is only open to Christians because this is being taught at a Christian institution, and they have a statement of faith. If you can believe, if you can say and believe that Christ died on the cross for your sins and rose again to destroy, uh, to give you salvation, destroy sin and give you salvation. If you can believe that and then write and get a uh, somebody from your church or your pastor to vouch for you, you can take these courses for credit. That's why we have to be careful who we allow in. It's only for Christians. But there are many out there that need to learn this material because this is not being taught anywhere else. Nowhere else are you learning this except mm -hmm. after this course. So, yeah, these are, these are going to continue on. For, uh, we, but if you take it full time, you can get the entire master's degree within two years. Now, that's an awful lot of uh, work to do. So I don't expect people to do it. But come on board. We'd love to have you. That's an academic degree. And what I'll do is I'll send you, I think I've sent you already the URL. You just go up and yeah. ask info at ves.edu, and you can get the information there from them for this course. M-A-P-I, it's called Master of Arts, in Polemics, uh, and Apologetics of Islam. Great. And so, and so if you look, look, at, at, and look at the description box, folks, you can see the uh, email there uh, to register. If you're interested, please uh, fire them an email uh, if you're interested. And I could vouch for Dr. Smith. Uh, Dr. Smith is, uh, is a leading scholar in this area, as you can see. 
Um, and he's probably one of the best out there uh, that, that can teach you. And, and also uh, our good friend, Dr. Daniel Brubaker as well, is, a, is an excellent scholar. So uh, Dr. Smith, before you go, can, can we just take some very quick questions before we, we, uh, we leave? Okay, so one of our, one of our viewers, uh, Karina, who's also one of my students in, my, in an online course that I'm teaching, uh, how do we bring this up to Muslims? It's so hard to explain mental gymnastics. I think what she's saying is this is almost an overload of information uh, for some uh, some of our young people, our young believers in Christ. Is there anything you can recommend, Jay, or maybe a, a website uh, that you can recommend that they read? Oh, listen, it's just going to erupt the Fander Films. Every, everything I'm saying is on Fander Films, P-F-A-N-D-E-R-F-I-L-M-S. Everything, I put up a video once every two to three days. And all of the videos are going over 10,000 views. You can see these are very popular. And I've never had this many views. In 14 years of putting videos up, I've never had this, type, this kind of response. And it's because no one else has really touched this material yet. But uh, as far as if you're in a discussion with a Muslim and, and you want to say, how can I introduce this into the discussion? This is how you do it. Anytime a Muslim makes a claim about Muhammad, makes a claim about the Quran, or makes a claim about Mecca, the book, the man in the place, the book, the man in the place. Anytime they make a, a claim about those three areas, all you have to do is prove it from the seventh century, not from the ninth, not from the tenth. Don't waste my time with the traditions. Where in the seventh century is this Muhammad? Where in the seventh century is this place called Mecca? Where in the seventh century is there any book called the Quran? See how easy that is? The onus is on them. And see what they do. And what we're finding is Muslims don't know how to prove it. They have no idea. They've never heard anybody ask this question before. The problem is they've asked us the same question about the Bible, have they not? That's right. Don't they ask us to prove that we can go right back to the original manuscripts and we never make those claims? Don't they ask us and say, isn't that what Wellhausen said in the 1800s when he said, how can you prove that there was a person named Jesus, that he died on the cross and rose again? A perfectly legitimate historical question. But it does a second thing, Tony. When you ask that question, this has nothing to do with Islamophobia. No. Nope. This has nothing to do with hate speech. Not at all. These are historical questions we're asking. We're not confronting Muhammad. We're not confronting his character. We're not confronting what he did with Aisha. I'm not using any of the, which borders hate speech. And I can understand why Muslims get upset when we bring up these, these what we call embarrassing questions about Muhammad. I'm tired of doing that. I don't care Dillis what, about whether he's embarrassing or not. I want to know whether he, just whether he existed. That's a much more germinal question. It is a historical question, and anybody can and should be asking this question. But I especially want Christians to ask this question. I know right. that atheists love our material. I know the Hindus love our material. I know the humanists just gobbling up, and they want, they want the PowerPoints. And I say, no, 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 no. I don't want you atheists or the humanists to actually use this material because you have no idea of what kind of damage this will do to your Muslim friend. You don't realize what it'll do to their faith. And you have nothing to replace it with. You have no alternative. You have no antidote. You have no answer. We are the only ones that should be using this material. For two reasons. No humanists or, 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 or atheists have ever dealt with textual criticism of anything they know of. They don't have to defend anything textually. There's mm -hmm. no text. It's mm -hmm. just opinion. And it changes depending on the whim of the person who's asking the question. And that's why atheism keeps changing, because they have nothing at all but themselves. That's right. Therefore, they have no idea of the power of textual criticism. Only Christians understand this argument. You understand it, Tony, because you're an expert in textual criticism. This is one of your fortes. That's why I go to you whenever I have a question. And that's why we need to make sure that Christians are the ones that learn this material. Christians use it, because if you're going to confront the Quran, then for heaven's sakes, give them an antidote. Give them the Bible. Bring them back to the Bible. I better get a smaller Quran. I, I always want to make my Quran small. <laughs> You're going to kind of confront this book, give me a bigger book. <laughs> I always make sure my Bible is bigger. <laughs> Which is the bigger, the better book. All right. I always right. make sure you bring it back to the Bible. If you're going to confront Muhammad in this book, then you better bring him to Jesus Christ. That's right. If you're going to confront Allah, then for heaven's sakes, bring him back to Yahweh. Amen. Bring him home. Bring Amen. him And Amen. we're the only ones that can do that. So That's this it. whole discussion that we've been having what for the last hour uh hour and a half or coming hour, two hours almost now. two hours well oh. they say time flies when you're having fun jay so i'm so, sorry uh, i'm only gone for one hour uh, that's okay I, i'm i'm okay are you okay for another 15 minutes 10 minutes or so 
Go okay. Ahead. So I got a question from uh, Sahi Luke. Uh, Tony Costa, question for you and Jay. What do you say about the character of Muslims like Farouk, who despite acknowledging Qadi and Ali admit Quran has variants, maintain preservation to the very dot? Now, I'm not sure who Farouk is, so uh, I'll just put the question on the screen there, uh, uh, Jay. It's a little long. It's another YouTube. Is another YouTube chalking. He's very well known on YouTube. Farouk has a problem because he's never asked. The, he's never answered this question himself. If if, if anybody's even going to say the same, the dot, he's absolutely an idiot. He's idiotic. It's obviously he doesn't know the historical context or the sequence of how the how the Arabic was formed. Because you cannot even. Why would you even waste your time putting dots in it? Shabir Ali Yasser Qadi would never make that kind of mistake. Right. So it's obvious. And Fuk, this is the problem with Farouk. He is a populist. He's like Muhammad Hijab. He is very popular. He's quick on the uptake. He loves to think that he knows. He does know Arabic, but he doesn't know the history of Arabic. He only knows modern standard Arabic. He has no idea that there were no dots in the 7th century. So that, that's stupid to make that kind of claim. So you can see right there why are you listening to a guy like that when he makes a, such a glaring error right from the get-go. Right, right. We also had another question here. Someone had asked me about um, our friend Robert Morey on his book, The Islamic Invasion. And I think the question has something to do with Maury's view of uh, Allah and the moon god. But anyway, let me just say I knew Dr. Maury. That one. That's a that's a common way. Let's take this. Let's take this off the screen. Let, let me take this off the screen and uh, let me just bring up the next one, uh, Jay. I'm you just trying to, to answer that one about Maury and the moon god. Yeah, you, you can go ahead. I'll just uh, look. Here it is. I'll just bring put on the screen there. Can you recommend the book Islamic Invasion by Dr. Uh, Robert Maury? I would not recommend it. Uh, when Dr. Mori was alive, he's now with the Lord. Uh, when he was alive, he confronted me about this and says, I'm going to write a book called The Islamic Invasion. I'm going to mention the laws of the moon god. And I pleaded with him. I pleaded with him not to write that book. And I said, you're going to become a laughingstock. The Muslims are going to laugh you out of town. Uh, and I said, please don't do it. It's, going to, it's, it's really going to affect your reputation. He went ahead and did it. And sure enough, all the Muslims tore him to pieces, and uh, including Shabir Ali and others. So, no, I would not recommend Dr. Mori's book on the Islamic invasion. I think it, it's very misrepresentative, and uh, I don't think it helps our cause. So over to you there, uh, Jay. No, and I think what the problem was Dr. Mori just didn't know, didn't know about the newest material. that we. And so let's listen, much of the newest material that we have found on not only on the name Allah, which is Ilaha, which comes uh, which comes from Nabataean Arabic. It's the Nabataean Aramaic for God, all the people. Everybody in the seventh century used the name Allah for God. The Christians did, the Jews did, anybody that spoke Arabic used, so did the Zoroastrians, so did the pagans, so did the, the atheists. They all use Allah for God in the same way that we today in English use G-O-D. But G-O-D has antecedents in German, the Gott, uh, which is actually Druidic. So you can you can see that the, the name the, the name God is not a moon god. You need to go and see if you're going to go and actually do a historical study on the name Allah itself from Ilaha, from Nabataean Aramaic. You can see that Ilaha is a generic name. It means the God. The God it's representing is Dushada, who is the senior God of the Nabataeans. And the Nabataeans, and if you're going to use that context, and I have used that context, and it's fun to see Muslims squirm because I say if you're going to use Allah as the true God, then that's a generic title. What's his real name? Well, his real name is Dushada. And who is Dushada? Well, he is a Nabataean God. And what does he have? Well, he has a wife. Her name is Alusa. Aluza. And what is her title? Well, her name is Aluza is Alat, which is the feminine form of Allah. Ooh, to yeah. <laughs> You've got a polytheistic God right there who has a wife. And he says in chapter 6, 101 of the Quran that God cannot have a wife. So already you've contradicted your own Quran, so don't use that name. So you can really play with that. That's much more, that's a much stronger argument than yeah. saying that he's a moon god. Yeah. So the word God, as 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 Dr. Smith pointed out, you know, having Teutonic roots and so forth. Uh, it's just think of it as I think it was Kenneth Cragg put it this way, Jay. That it's like a box. It's it's what you put into it. I mean, the word itself uh, is is generic, but it's what do we mean by God? And so our Arabic, Arabic brothers and sisters use Allah when they refer to God. But the question is, is the Allah of the Bible the same as the Allah of the Quran? And Can so, I yeah, you please go ahead. Go ahead. This is the one that I get from Christians. This is the one I get from Muslims. This is the one I get from the whole insider paradigm. The whole insider movement starts from this paradigm that the Allah of the Quran is the same as the Allah of the Bible. When right. I hear that, I go right up to the person and I put my hand out and I shake their hand. And I say, God bless you. I'm so good, especially if it's a Muslim. Let's, just, let's you do that, Tony. You're going to be up there right now. You just said that Allah of the Quran and Allah of the Bible are the same. They're the God of Abraham. I want to shake your hand, Tony. Yeah. 
thank God, as a Muslim, you have finally agreed that your Allah of the Quran came to earth, walked and talked in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. Thank God that your your Allah of the Quran is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Thank <laughs> God that your God of the Quran entered time and space, came to earth, died on the cross, and rose again on the third day. And thank God, after 1,400 years, you, Tony, and Abdul, you have admitted that Allah has a son. Now, what have I just done? How long did it take yeah. me to do that? Ten seconds, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What have I just said in those four things? Yeah, I mean, it's just equivocation. It's Absolutely. equivocation. And I've underlined where our God differs from their God in the four major points, all within 10 seconds. In That's doing right. that, I'm defining who my Allah is. And if you're going to say the Allah of the Bible, if you're going to say it's the same God, he has to be able to enter time and space. He has to be God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He has to have died and rose again, and he has to have a son. And no Muslim will agree to that. Every time I've done that with a Muslim, they pull my hand out, their hand out of mine by the time I'm on the third subject. And I say, why have you pulled your hand out? He says, because I don't agree with that. Then, then I said, don't you ever say in my presence again that we share the same God. Your God is not big enough. He can't enter time and space. That's right. Your God is not big enough. He did not die on the cross for me. Your God has no personality, has no relationship with me. Your God is incapable of understanding who I am or what I've done. And your God has not saved me from death, whereas my God has. Get a bigger God. We've got him. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 And of course, uh, Surah 29, verse 46 says, say your God and our God is one and to him we submit. So the Quran itself gives them that impression that we have the same God. But as you rightly pointed out, the difference between their God and our God, I'm just going to borrow J.B. Phillips here. Uh, Jay, remember that book he wrote, your God is too small. And the God of Islam is way too small, right. not like the glorious triune majesty that we worship. So. Yeah. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Smith, for, for being with us. You really are a gift to questions. Uh, let me just check one more. Uh, let me see if there's any more here. I think we may have, I think we may have uh, used up all the questions we have here. Uh, yeah, I think okay. we've got all the questions covered there, uh, Jay. I okay. think, and I think we should also mention as well uh, that the God that our God, Jay, is not some nameless generic uh, guy called Allah some generic God just called Allah, but that he has a covenantal name that, his name, that his name is Yahweh. Let me just say this in closing, and this is maybe a good way to close off. Remember yeah. back in Exodus 3, when a, uh, Moses was being asked to go down to Egypt, and he, he tried to get out of it. He did not want to go, and he kept on saying, what about my brother Aaron? Finally, he turns to God, and he asked the pivotal question, what is your name? So when I go down to Egypt, they'll know what God I represent. And what is the name that God gave Moses at that time? Yeah. I am who I am. Okay. Yahweh, the one who is. The one who is. So God gives him that name in verse 14. What does he say in verse 15? This shall be my name. From Memorial name. Generation. Yeah. This shall be my name forever. Why do you think God said that? I think God said that because he knew today this was going to be a problem. He knew today that the Muslims are going to claim that name. They're going to say Allah is that. I know all the insider movement wants to say that Allah is God, that God, that we share the same God. And God was saying at this time, don't you ever confuse my name. Don't you ever confuse my name with another God. Look at Amen. Deuteronomy 18. Remember in Deuteronomy 18, Muslims always like us to go there to verse 18 because they say, they say this is a proof that Muhammad is in the Quran. And they always say... That, that there will become someone like me who is like unto me. But re that's verse 18. Read verse 19 and 20. What yeah. does verse 19 and 20 says? Be careful about anybody who does not come in my name. Verse 20, somebody who does not come in my name, put him to death. We're yeah. to put to death that Muhammad. Yeah. We're to put to death that God. Because he yeah. God does not share his his uh, it does not share his supremacy with anybody right. else. And he right. doesn't share his name with anybody else. That's right. And that name is unique. Now, remember, if you want to find out where that name is, just look in the Old Testament. It's found 6,823 times. Every prophet knew that name. Did Muhammad ever use that name? No, never. No. Never. Yeah. Did and also, Jesus ever use that name? And, and also, uh, did Jesus, he would have used that name as a Jew. Absolutely. When in you John read 8, the scriptures. He, yeah. he actually claimed it for himself. I am. He that name for himself and look at the reaction of the jews they took up stones to stone him yeah. so it's obviously that's the name we're to use yahweh now why is it we no longer have that in our bible what do we have there instead what's in your english bible every time yeah. yahweh it's yeah, l-o-r-d it, yeah we have the capital l-o-r-d that's right now stop and think of yourself have you ever come to you would come to england you there's a house of lords right yep have yep. you looked at the house of lords have They're i all first they're all what? 
They're all senile. <laughs> They're all over age. This is where you retire when the yeah. House of Parliament, the House of Lords, and you stay the for the rest of the That's they right. Have to be wheeled in with wheelchairs. That's our God. That's who God not. is. Of course and not. Just, why, I, even me, I'm saying, why are we using Lord? Why isn't in all of our Bibles, in the English Bible, yeah. in the Arabic Bible, why don't we get Yahweh back in there again? Yeah. Because this will never be a confusion. No longer. And I'm not saying for the Arabs, stop using Allah. I would be careful because if, if anybody, the only people who I should think we should should use the name Allah should be the Arabs. The rest of us, for heaven's sakes, get out yep. of get away yep. from Allah. That is yep. a title. That is not a name. It is a, a polytheistic title. It is a pagan title. I don't even like the word the word Lord or God. I want to get back to Yahweh because yeah. if it was so important for God to introduce His name to Moses, if he, if this is what this is how all the Jews recognize what God He was representing, why should not be the same for us today? Yeah, and, and I, I think like, I think future translations. I think I know the Holman Christian Study Bible was tr was bringing Yahweh back into the Old Testament, but not as not everywhere. But I think uh, that we should probably follow the lead of the Jerusalem Bible and start using the divine name uh, where it appears. I would so love to one more question, Jay. I just noticed. Uh, in fact, my wife pointed it out to me. Uh, it's this is from Eli Sheets. Uh, Jay, can you uh, can you give a brief summary on how the Hadiths were fabricated? And then we'll end with that. <laughs> <laughs> How many hours do you need, Jay? Oh, there. Here we go. I'm, I should go and show you. I have a whole graph on this, but let me just try to do it in two minutes. All right. The Hadith. Remember, Everything we know about who Muhammad was, everything we know about what Muhammad said, everything we know about how Islam began, everything we know about how the Quran came together, everything we know about Mecca, Medina, all these other the other cities, everything we know about Islam, everything, does not come from the 7th century at all. None of it comes from the 7th century. It doesn't even come from the 8th century. We don't have anything about this in the 8th century. Oh, we had Ibn Ishaq, but where is Ibn Ishaq today? Yeah. You have to go to the biography of Muhammad. So... Here is the biography of Muhammad that you have to go to. Yeah. But notice what name they have up there. The translation of Ibn Ishaq Siratu Rasulullah. Yeah. Ibn Ishaq? That is a lie. The publishers did that. Yes. We have nothing from Ibn Ishaq. Not, yeah. a, not, one, letter, right. not one word. We don't have a thing from Ibn Ishaq. So where do we get this? Where, did, where was this actually written? This is a big tome. Yeah, this is the life of Muhammad. This is the earliest life of Muhammad you're going to get anywhere. This is Ibn Hisham. This is not right. Him. That's correct. He takes right. what he likes of Ibn Ishaq and he throws the rest away. This is written 70 years after Ibn Ishaq. Right. Proving that everything that we know about what Muhammad did comes from 833. Muhammad died in 632. So we're talking about 200 years later. Two centuries. Yeah. But that's just the life of Muhammad. That's the sit -up. The much more expansive, the much more complete material that we go to, how Muslims know how to walk, talk, eat, drink, sleep, all comes from the hadith, the sayings of Muhammad, all the things he said. Al-Buhari, according to the traditions, was given 600,000 of these sayings. Yes. And from those 600,000, he whittled them down, dig, 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 threw them out, threw them out, threw them out, threw them out. All of them, except for 7,397. Out of 600,000, he whittles it down to 7,397. That's just 2%. 98% he throws out. Yep. When? 870. This is 240 years after Muhammad. How did he know that that 98% is not what Muhammad said? Obviously, he must have had a criteria. What was his criteria? It's not. Right. It's not where the names of people, so-and-so got it from so-and-so, who got it from so-and-so, who got it from so-and-so. Well, hold on a minute. Did any of those so-and-sos write it down? No, they didn't. So what is this known as? This is called oral tradition. Do you see a problem with oral tradition, Tony Costa? Oh, oh yeah, for sure. I mean, it sounds like Chinese whispers. It sounds like that old game. That old You're game just... you play at birthday parties. Yeah. In a 15-minute period, if you say something in one person's ear and it goes down through 15 different people, 15 minutes later, the person who finally tells you what that person said, it's two completely different things. If that oh, could happen in 15 minutes, can you imagine what could happen in 240 years? Yeah. You get That's 90. Yeah, you get that huge amount of disparity. Absolutely. Enormous yeah. amount of disparity. So everything Absolutely. we know about the Siddha, everything about the Tafsir, it comes from oral tradition, from people who probably did not even exist. Because you could create whatever name you want to, depending on whether or not you want it to be authoritative or not. Right. So you can understand why almost all the scholars today are absolutely suspicious. Here, but, but beyond that, look at this. Look and see where Al-Buhari came from. 
Did Al Buhari live in Mecca and Medina? No, no, he did not. Where did he come from? Bukhara. Where is Bukhara? That is in Uzbekistan. That is four thousand miles away. What yeah. about what about Ibn Hisham? Where did Ibn Hisham come from? Well, Ibn Hisham came from Basra, but it wasn't called Basra then. It was called. It was had a whole different name. But he spent. He he would grew up in Cairo, and then he did his work in Baghdad. That's eighteen hundred yeah. kilometers away. Yeah. What about the Tafsir and the Tahrik, that all comes from a guy named Tabari. Tabari is in what is today Iran. That's the Baristan. That is in Iran. That's 2,800 kilometers away. So all of these guys who wrote these sayings of Muhammad, they lived in Iran, they lived in Uzbekistan, they lived in Cairo and Egypt, but they did all their work in Baghdad. That's hundreds of miles away, all of us in the north. That's where the civilizations were. That's where the discussions yeah. were. That is where the seminaries were. That is where the Quran is being put together. As the Quran is being put together, so are the saints. Because now the Abbasids who come to power in 749, they have now 70 years to finally get the Siddha in place. They have to wait another 40 years to get the Hadith in place. And then they have six different authoritative Hadith, which all contradict each other. Then they have to wait till 923 to get the Tafsir and the Tafik in the place. Then you have Baidawi, Zamakshari, Suyuti, and all the others who come after the 10th century. All of this is two to 300 years too too late yeah and that's why we're saying throw it all away it's two to three hundred years too late and it's two it's hundreds of miles too far north none of this was written in mecca and medina none of these men ever saw muhammad ever knew muhammad ever were in mecca ever were there when in the seventh century yeah. so i mean let me just give you an example washington george washington 1776 if you look at George Washington and you said that nothing was written about George Washington, now we know quite a few is written about, quite a few things were written by him, but were they written by his uh, contemporaries? Yes. If we were dependent on what we know about George Washington, we would not get the Sira, that the biography of George Washington, until 1986. Yeah. We would not get looking at the same criteria. We would not get the Hadith. Of George Washington until 2016, just five years ago. That means Al Buhari would have just written it. A uh, George Washington five years ago. We That's would right. not. We will still not. We will still have to wait for the Tafsir and the Tafi until 2060. I wouldn't even yeah. be alive then. Can you see the problem? Yeah, big problem. Major, if, major problem. If you're looking at Jesus, just take a look at Jesus. If we had nothing about Jesus, what he said and did which would be the gospel accounts. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If we would have to depend on what Muslims have to depend on for Muhammad, we would know nothing about Jesus, what he said and did till the third century. Yeah. How would we defend him? Yeah, exactly. And why exactly. are people saying this? Bingo. Yeah. That's why for that? Yeah. I mean, this, is, this is probably, this is the million dollar question. This is the elephant in the room that no Muslim wants to talk about. You need to put it on a timeline. And it just destroys the edifice of Islam. It destroys right. Muhammad. It destroys Mecca. It destroys the Quran. It destroys everything we know about how Islam began. And now we pretty well know that almost all of it is fictitious. Wow. Well, there you go, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as you can see, Islam is built on sand. It's not built on rock. And its foundations are falling apart, even as we speak. Last, last time we spoke together, Jay, remember you telling me something. And that is Islam is falling apart. Uh, a lot of Muslims are leaving Islam. Many of them, by God's grace, are coming to faith in the Lord Jesus. And I want you to realize that we do this not because we hate Muslims. Because uh, I know Jay, he, for many, many years in London, England, he would be at Speaker's Corner. And sometimes he'd be assaulted. He'd come home with, with blood on his shirt. And his wife would just put it in the laundry, get it all cleaned up, and give they him another break. Here. Yeah, yeah. They broke and glasses. They broke his glasses. And why would a man of his, why would a scholar want to do that? Get beaten up by Muslims and 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 be uh, be uh, scorned and, and, and because we love them. We love them for the sake of Christ. And we want to see our Muslim friends know Jesus and come to know their, their heavenly father as God has revealed himself. And so we do this out of love because we love truth and we speak the truth in love. How can you not help but love these people? Because they yeah. have such a passion. I'm jealous of their passion. Yes. They I do. Would. 
want to know who God is. They do yes. want to obey him and submit to him. I mean, I've dedicated almost 40 years of my life to these people, and I would not, I would dedicate another 40 years because they are the most engaging people I've met. They're most, they're most passionate people I met. They're the most charismatic people I met. They just have the wrong God. They just yeah. have the wrong Jesus. They just yeah. have the wrong scripture, and we need to bring them home to the real That's God. That's it. Real Jesus in the real. That's spirit. it, and they do make the best Christians, Jay. Uh, from my personal experience, I've seen a lot of Muslims come to faith in Christ. I had the privilege of baptizing many of them, and they make the, the one of the most passionate Christians who love the Lord best? Jesus. They sure are. Look at Hatun. Look at Al Fadi. Oh, I know they're awesome, awesome people. And and folks, you'll you'll meet Hatun on on this channel, and also uh, my dear brother, our dear brother El Fadi as well. These are these are just wonderful people that God has brought out out of the clutches of Islam and brought to His marvelous grace. And so, uh, thank you so much, um, Jay. Thank you so much for taking up your time to be here. I know you're a busy man. I know that you've got a lot on the go. Uh, we want we will pray for you. Pray for your ministry. And uh, God willing, we hope to see you down the road. See you again. And uh, well, let's talk about Mecca. I'd love to talk about Mecca. With next you. time you got it. That's Muhammad. that's a date. That's a date. So Mecca. we'll talk about Mecca and Muhammad. Eminem. Eminem's. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We've done the book. Now we need to do the man in the place. That's it. That's it. Man in the place. Okay. Well, you've really uh, okay. So you you've really uh, got us excited for that upcoming uh, uh, upcoming show. Thanks again, Jay. Uh, the Lord bless you, and thank you everyone for taking up your Friday night to be with us tonight. Uh, remember that uh, Muslims are part of the Great Commission. Love them for Jesus' sake, and pray for them that God would change their hearts and bring them to salvation in the Lord Jesus. Amen. Good night, everybody. God bless. God bless you. Bye bye.